thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk about task-based language teaching today, as you know. As it happens, I just finished a 45-hour uh, PhD-level seminar on TBLT this semester. Finished last Monday was the last session. Students from Georgetown, American, and Maryland. And so trying to reduce the whole thing to one hour today uh, is quite a task. And I should tell you right away that I'm not going to go through all the SLA research behind all this stuff and the studies. There's no way I could do that in, in the time. What I'm going to do is just indicate occasionally where there has been a lot of work on some issues of this. And I'm also going to point out a couple of problematic areas in TBLT where research is ongoing, but we really don't know the, the right answer uh, for certain sections. And the other thing by way of introduction is that what I'm going to be talking about today is task-based, not task-supported language teaching. And the difference as I'm sure most of you know, is that task-supported language teaching is where the program uses a grammatical syllabus, structural, le well, some lexical, notional, functional, any, any kind of linguistic unit of analysis, and then uses tasks, pedagogic tasks, to practice the structures. And in many cases, the tasks are not that different from old exercises. If you look at the books, the thing that's changed is the covers of the textbooks, but the in insides are very similar. I'm going to be talking about task-based, where the content of the syllabus is not a list of grammatical structures or lexical items or whatever, but rather a set of pedagogic tasks. That's the organizational unit for the syllabus, for the needs analysis, for the testing, for everything. The only thing it's not relevant for is the program evaluation, for which we use standard educational evaluation procedures. Nothing fancy there. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, you see, I told you it'd be chaos the first bit. Now, what have I done? Why TBLT? It did come up. So what's the rationale? Very simply, um, and this is important, I think, for especially when you have people like you do here who are learning languages to a higher level for very clear needs. Uh, the courses need to be relevant. Uh, when you're dealing with adults who are giving up time and money uh, for, for language training, they expect it to be relevant to their language needs, just as if we were going to the doctor, we wouldn't expect them to just dish out the same medicine who, as you walk in the door. They do an, a diagnosis first, find out what's wrong with you, and then you've heard more and more of personalized medicine, where even beyond the particular illness, it's the particular illness as a function of your particular physiology. Uh, and we don't do this much in language training, but I don't see why not. We demand this kind of individualization of any other kind of service that we seek. Why would we not be doing this for language training? Why would we not be doing language training, which is tailored uh, to the needs of particular groups? Task-based language teaching starts with a needs analysis to find out what those needs are. And so in that sense, it's much more relevant. And as we'll see when we get to the end, what are the results of some of the evaluations of TBLT, one of the two robust findings is precisely that both teachers and students always respond very favorably to TBLT courses, having gone through them, compared with what they were doing before. Because they're, they're not silly. They can recognize that this course has been designed at least generally for them, not for somebody with totally different language needs. And so for foreign service officers, uh, diplomatic service personnel and so forth, they have uh, clearly definable needs and they have needs for functional L2 abilities. In other words, they don't need to know about the language uh, so much as actually know how to use the language. They need an ability for language use. Uh, and of course, TBLT is currently being used in more and more academic, occupational, vocational, and for social survival purposes. Other, briefly, other advantages of TBLT is it avoids problems with the language te teaching status quo. We know there are all sorts of problems with traditional forms-based language teaching, where the syllabus consists of an inventory of structures and so forth. Again, I don't have time to go through all the research on this, all the SLA theory of the last 40 years on this, but basically there are major problems with so-called interventionist synthetic syllabuses where you cut up the language into bite-sized pieces, whatever the unit of analysis is, feed it to the learners like the herrings to the seals at the zoo, uh, here comes a relative clause, catch, you know, today's Wednesday, that's why we're doing it, very artificial. Uh, it's also, however, problems with the other extreme, the non-interventionist 
approaches like Crash and Terrell, the natural approach, for example, where you have a pure focus on meaning. Again, I haven't got time to go through all the research on this, but one obvious problem is that adults do not have the same ability for incidental learning, especially not for instance learning, in other words, learning of lexical items, collocations, things for which there are no rules governing them, uh, that little children do. So while, as Krashen used to say, su surrounding uh, learners with comprehensible input would work and does work, of course, for little children, uh, for adults who still have that ability, but a reduced ability to do that kind of learning, uh, it's less than optimal. And anyway, it's inefficient for, for language learners. It takes too long, requires too much rich input. TBLT provides a viable alternative to both those approaches using a focus on form and enhanced incidental learning, of which more later. Thirdly, TBLT is consistent with SLA research findings. It employs an analytic syllabus with focus on form. It encourages incidental as well as intentional learning. So incidental learning, like when a little child is playing with toys on the floor and is picking up language that he or she is hearing in the immediate environment. So incidental learning, learning while focusing on something else, focusing on the meaning of a text, for example. Uh, I noticed that uh, having walked around this morning, there's all these, incident, these extensive reading programs upstairs and, and there's plenty of research behind that uh, for people being able to learn a lot of vocabulary and more from extensive reading. Well, that's ideally incidental reading. In other words, we're incidental learning where they are focusing on the stories, the messages and so forth, but picking up uh, parts of the language without even realizing they're doing so. And the result, if it stays that way, is implicit knowledge. Knowledge that they have of the L2 without realizing they have it. They're unaware of that knowledge. It's not explicit where they're conscious of it, but it's knowledge they have but don't know they have it. So it's like what native speakers have of their own language. Most native speakers know next to nothing about their own language, unless they're people like you who do it for a living. Uh, and that's, in a way, the ideal state for our adult learners of a foreign language, if we can do it in the time available. And SLA, for again reasons I mostly don't have time for, has psycholinguistic credibility. For example, we don't try and impose an external linguistic syllabus on people regardless of their developmental stage. Peenemann back in the 70s showed that doesn't work. Every study that's tested it ever since shows that doesn't work. A, a novice teacher, an inexperienced teacher, can be under the illusion that it works because that kind of teaching, the person often goes in, presents the structure du jour, uh, drills it, gives a rule, practices it like crazy, and learners, especially your kind of learners, who are going to be very smart and very good at this kind of left brain stuff, they'll give you back the correct answer. It's like linguistic ping pong. You know, you say it, they repeat it, and so on and so forth. But to kid yourself that they therefore know now have knowledge they can use in the real world is, as Krashen pointed out, just kidding yourself. Uh, at the end of the class, you may say something and they'll get the same thing wrong that in the class they were getting correct because right now they're suddenly not focusing on that as an object. They're now focusing on trying to communicate using the L2. Uh, so in many ways, uh, TBLT doesn't even try to do that. TBLT tries to cater to the what Pitt Corder called the learner's internal syllabus, which is these regular developmental stages that reflected in many things, autonomous grammar, uh, common error types, U-shaped behavior, all sorts of things which are well documented in the literature. Uh, other advantages for most of us would be that TBLT is genuinely learner-centered. Course content, as I've already said, is determined by learner needs and interests. The attention is to language, for to language form is reactive. In other words, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the, the demands on the teacher in TBLT are higher. One of the reasons they're higher is because the teacher is in a reactive mode, is responding to problems that learners have. We teach grammar just like other, other forms do. We teach grammar, pronunciation, all, all the whole nine yards, but we don't do it because it's Monday, we're going to do this structure, which is absurd anyway, but we do it, uh, here we go, you see. We, we, seize, we seize the moment, we seize opportunities to draw problematic features to learners' attention as they arise in genuine communication. Uh, so we're responding to the learner's internal syllabus rather than trying to, to impose an external syllabus designed by a curriculum uh, materials writer who is probably, at the time we teach, sitting on a beach in the Bahamas somewhere sipping martinis and has never met your learners, has no idea what they're ready for. It would also be, of course, a miracle if all the learners in one classroom were ready for the same structure on the same day. It just doesn't happen. 
Okay, we recognize in TBLT that processability, in other words, what the learners can process in the input determines what's learnable for them, and learnability determines teachability. Again, if you know your Peenemann, he documented that, and many people have tried, tested that and got the same result in different languages. Other advantages, TBLT uh, focuses heavily on learning by doing, which has additional memory advantages later. People tend to remember language that they associate with particular things they did. So for example, if you were teaching somebody to make a telephone call in another language, it's a big difference between having them actually try to make telephone calls rather than read a dialogue reporting somebody else, usually a mythical character in a textbook, making a telephone call. Simple things like that. The classroom climate in TBLT is egalitarian. The teacher is the facilitator of language learning, or as somebody else called it, guide, not God. Uh, and assessment is criterion reference, not norm reference. Again, I'll be coming back to that later in the talk. Six stages in the design, implementation, and evaluation. Needs analysis, two steps, two stages in TBLT needs analysis. First of all, to identify the target tasks, the things that the learner actually needs to be able to do in the L2. And in, in the case of, of diplomats and, and security p personnel, there's going to be a lot of occupation result, uh, related target tasks. But there are also, for many of them, there'll be what I call social survival tasks, because many of them will be living overseas for a year, three years, whatever it is. And although a lot of the things can be done for them by locally recruited uh, L1 speaking personnel in many cases, in other cases, they will have to do some of it themselves. Uh, and so these social survival tasks, you'll see examples in a minute, come up. For the syllabus design, we take the target tasks, we classify them into target task types, I'll show you this in a minute, and from those we derive the pedagogic tasks. We then sequence the pedagogic tasks by increasing task complexity, not linguistic complexity. Again, I'll illustrate all of this in a moment. And we get the task syllabus. Materials are based on uh, sequ sequences of, of pedagogic tasks of increasing complexity uh, and delivered in the classroom, guided by a set of currently 10 methodological principles. These are sort of the general big picture things that are motivated by SLA research, research in the philosophy of education and others. And the key thing is that the teacher is responsible for the pedagogic procedures. In other words, how do you actually realize those methodological principles in the classroom? There's no way that somebody like me should be telling teachers how to do that. The teacher is the expert on the local classroom situation. It is the teacher who chooses how to instantiate the methodological principle. I'll give you examples in a minute. And finally, the uh, student assessment can learners perform, pedagog uh, perform target tasks to criteria. And so think of the driver's test, for example, which most of us have taken somewhere. How we do on that test is not determined by how the person right before us or right after us did on the test. Uh, we either meet the criterion uh, or we don't. And we pass the test or we don't. It's pass-fail, uh, it's not graded on a curve, it's not graded how we do compared with another testing driver or anything. It's uh, criterion-based target uh, task-based performance test. And then evaluation, as I said, is as normal. Now, your next talk in this series, which Cathy Dowdy is going to give, is on how you go about identifying target tasks. So I'm going to pretty much skip over this today, just remind you there are two steps. And what we're trying to find out is not which structures does somebody need, uh, but what tasks are they going to have to do in the target language or through the target language. We also, while we're doing it, we collect data on which of those tasks are the most frequent for them and which are the most important for them. That's not always the same thing. You can have a task which is critically important when it occurs, but doesn't occur that often, and vice versa. Uh, a student, a PhD student at Maryland, um, Kyoko Kobayashi Hillman, uh, did a term paper, one of her required term papers. She did a database study of uh, diplomats, American diplomats in Japan, and uh, identified 52 target tasks for them. I would guess many of these apply in other countries too, but not all of them. There'd be some culturally specific things. There's a handful of them. There's seven of the 52. They have to watch. Th this all came from them, of course, not from her. I mean, she was used various methods to find this information and so forth. Watching TV news reports in Japanese and discussions on TV, conducting site visits to factories, companies, and small businesses, delivering a celebration speech, of which more in a moment, at a formal anniversary event, conduct a visa interview, converse with police and prisoners 
prison officials about US citizen issues. I visited your jail this morning, spectacular. I mean, you are so lucky with some of the stuff you have here. Um, interv converse, uh, interview a nominee for a cultural exchange program. Somebody wants to do a Fulbright and you, the person has to interview them for that. Order a product or service from a vendor, obtain directions, etc., etc. Now, not everybody in an embassy will do all of these tasks. Obviously, some of these are going to be done by, in a big embassy by the consular staff. Others, in a small embassy, they may, in a consulate, there may just be two people and somebody's doing some of the things that would be done by somebody else. The general principle in, in TBLT we find is that the bigger the example of the institution, the more specialized the people within it, and vice versa. If you have a small institution, it breeds generalists. Uh, but not time to go into all the examples of that today. Kyoko also uh, looked at some of what we call the social survival tasks, and of the 15 she identified, these are nine, check in and out of a hotel, rent a car, make a reservation, order a meal, purchase a train ticket, etc. Again, in some cases, locally recruited staff would do this for the ambassador and some of the other diplomats, but in many cases, people are gonna get caught out in the provinces and they're gonna to have to do some of these things themselves. And in some cases, especially if they're working, say, in a consulate rather than in the, main, in the capital city, they may be having to do a lot more of this themselves. Uh, why does this keep happening? What am I doing? Okay. Um, I'll skip this. There's a whole, there's a huge literature on how to do needs analyses. It's been well researched. There's lots of examples in the literature, in the journals, in whole books on this. Uh, and I'll leave it for Kathy to go through this stuff next time. Suffice to say, we use multiple sources of information, multiple methods, and we, we uh, triangulate. In other words, we see whether we're getting the same results from, say, two different sources of information and two different methods. And we sometimes even have the luxury of doing source by method triangulation. Uh, but it's not, as, as she will explain, it's not just a question of, do, we certainly don't do all those, those methods. This is just the, the list that are available. But if you just did two, for example, the general principle is you start with the most open methods. So if you don't know what a job consists of, that's not really true here. You have a pretty good idea. But if you didn't, then you might start with an unstructured interview so you don't want to preclude the possibility of learning stuff you don't know and then for coverage of the population you'd use something like a questionnaire or a survey again that's slightly redundant here because you have a good uh, handle on who does on what your people do the second stage is having identified the target tasks and by the way I hear there has been well, I, somebody from French was telling me about a, a needs analysis done in French here uh, for French uh, learners this morning um, in 2012, I didn't know about that. That was way before um, most people got onto this stuff. And then another um, needs analysis has recently been concluded by a committee, I understand, at the, for the whole FSI. Um, and as I say, Kyoko uh, did one for Japanese, which also has useful information in it, I think, for beyond just the Japanese um, embassies overseas and consulates overseas. The second part of the needs analysis is having identified the target task, you collect examples of language use which surrounds successful completion of those target tasks. That generally means observing how native speakers of the L2 do them. You can do it with non-native speakers. You can observe Americans doing you know, tasks in Japanese, but why bother? Why do that? Because you risk having a slightly deviant version. Now, of course, some of these characters get to such a high level that who's going to notice? Uh, but all other things being equal, you'll generally use native speaker models. Um, some people say, well, that's native speakerism. You know, you're, you're being prejudiced against non-native speakers. Well, if that's the case, I am then native speakerist because I do think there's a rationale for using native speaker versions unless there's some reason not to. Um, then we analyze the target discourse. There's a whole huge literature on this as well. Suffice to say, think of it like data mining. In other words, we're not trying to do a traditional discourse analysis with all the constraints and requirements that has, like multiple levels of analysis, consists of relationships between levels and so on and so forth. Rather, we're doing an analysis of discourse. That's why I use that terminology rather than discourse analysis. We're not trying to provide a generative model that can be applied to future unseen samples. We're just trying to milk the samples of the L2 for everything we can, we can get out of them. So we're looking especially for uh, target discourse specific lexis and collocations because as you'll see in a moment, those are two of the things that are routinely sacrificed in traditional language teaching materials. In the process of simplifying input, which is what most grammatical 
materials do, one of the ways they simplify is to cut out or at least cut down uh, unknown lexical or spe specialized lexis and collocations, but that is exactly what they need to know. Uh, it's counterproductive to do that. It increases comprehensibility, but there are about 15 studies in the literature now, empirical studies, showing that in fact you can maintain almost the same level of comprehensibility with what we're going to see as elaborated discourse, not simplified, where you keep in all that stuff and, and compensate for it in other ways, uh, which means you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting the increased comprehensibility without sacrificing the stuff they need to learn which is counterproductive, so it, it helps both comprehension and acquisition. And we use um, authentic samples of this, not our intuitions. Again, most, most commercially published grammatically based materials are done on the basis of the intuitions of the textbook writer and or on word frequency lists that the publisher provides you. You know, if you're writing for level three on such and such a scale, like the CFR, whatever it is, you're allowed to use these verb tenses and these 500 or 2,000 words, nothing more, and so forth. And that's why you get such artificial, artificial sounding uh, input as well. Uh, we use authentic samples because all the studies I've ever seen that have compared commercially textbook, commercial textbook written dialogues, reading passages, whatever, and the real thing, where they've actually gone out and recorded how people actually do something, show huge differences. Sometimes the commercial things are laughable, they're risible, they are nothing like what people need to know if they're really going to do this. Well, in TBLT, we start with the assumption that we're going to teach what is relevant for them, and that means finding out what is the real thing that people do. I'll try not to do this. Um, now, again, there's lots of studies. Here are a couple done by Maryland students in the last couple of years. Uh, Stephen O'Connell, um, we were working, we were do, volunteering at a thing called Casa de Maryland, which is a, a sort of a welfare program for mostly Latino uh, immigrants in Langley Park, or about two miles from the campus. And for a couple of, actually for four years altogether, I would be taking students from, PhD students from our program and from Georgetown, and we would go up to this place. And we did a needs analysis for them. We did it again a year later to find out. It's mostly Spanish-speaking uh, migrant workers, uh, some French West Africans, and a few odd, odds and bods. Uh, and one of the target tasks that was identified by the needs analysis was how to negotiate a police traffic stop. Because a lot of these very recently arrived Latino workers, the first job they do, not all of them, but the men I'm talking about, the women have other jobs they do, sort of maid service kind of things, is they buy a cheap pickup truck, they get a lawnmower, and they drive around and they gradually work up a list of clients for whose houses they cut the grass. And one of the things that they reported in the knees and houses again and again was that they're constantly being pulled, up, pulled over. Now this is Maryland, not, not DC now. And in Maryland, I'm not sure what the law is here, but in Maryland, a policeman is legally entitled to pull over any commercial vehicle without any cause at all. And they do, they pull over all sorts of people. But a lot of these old beat up second or third hand pickup trucks have things wrong with them. So very often when they pull them over, it's because there's a missing tail light or something like that, or the driver went through a turn without signaling or all sorts of things like that. They pull them over and you've got to imagine this. A lot of these people come from countries where dealing with the police is a no-no because basically you're going to have to pay money uh, and you may not get anything except a lighter purse at the end of it. I've lived in some of these countries myself and I can tell you that in one of them, all us gringos or foreigners anyway, we would travel around with money in a license because you know you're going to get pulled over and you know you've got to bribe the person. That's all they want. And so what happens is you give them the license. They take it out and they say, muy bien, señor Long. Very good, uh, Mr. Long. And the hand goes in the pocket. Muy bien, muchas gracias, que se vaya bien. You know, good, Godspeed, you know, hope, hope things go well. And they're making their last three or four days of salary because it doesn't cover the whole month and you're on your way. That's how institutionalized it is. It's even, le it's even lexicalized in Mexican Spanish, for example. You know, they say, they're biting today, meaning the police are pulling in people like crazy because it's the 28th of the month, the 29th, and the, the sour is it's finished. Now, you, you think, well, that's humorous, which it is, uh, but you've got to remember that a lot of these guys come from, say, Central America and other places where this is how it works, and they don't know that that's not how you deal with American policemen. 
In fact, if you start offering them money when they pull you over, you're in worse trouble than the, from the missing, head, missing tail light. And in fact, they don't know that you do not get out of the car, whereas down there, you have to get out of the car and all the rest of it. So many things in doing a target task like this that are cultural background knowledge and so forth, never mind the language, we'll come to that in a minute. So having heard that this was a constant problem, and remember, they don't speak much English at all, these guys. And the police, a few police do have some Spanish, but as we found out, most of them don't. Uh, so one of the target tasks for these people was negotiating a police traffic stop. And it's one of these things that isn't high, high frequency, but it happens to all of them. And when it happens, it's critically important. Um, so uh, Stephen O'Connell got ride-alongs, if you know what they are, where a lot of police departments encourage the general public to come and you know, drive with them to see what it's like and build relations. And so he did ride-alongs with three different police departments, collected the data on how these things unfold. And then what we do in TBLT, and I'm using this because it's an English example so everybody can follow it, uh, is we find, we find, first of all, what are the moves, what are the stages in this speech event? And there's one on the board. Now, you've got a handout because I knew this wouldn't be big enough for people to read, right? On the handout, do you, did everybody get a handout? Oh, you didn't. Okay, well, never mind. Can you read that roughly? You can see that what he found was that there were three different outcomes. Three different outcomes were possible. On the left, the policeman might issue a warning. In the middle, he might issue a repair order. And on the right, he issues a citation, which means you've either got to go to court and contest it, or you pay up you know, before that happens and so forth. And then there are various explanations. He goes in, I've chosen the easiest one here just to show you. It's the one on the left where he basically goes back to his car, uh, checks you out on, on the computer and so forth, and then comes back. And if you've got the handout, uh, there's some quite amusing stuff which I can't actually use because the dialogue's on the handout, not up here, because we thought it'd be too, 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 uh, uh, too small for you to read. But you can see examples there of collocations that would typically be Im removed from a textbook dialogue of the same encounter, and the textbook dialogue would be very different from the real thing anyway. Now here's one which Kyoko did for Japanese. One of the target tasks for diplomats in Japan was the dreaded celebration speech. And it's dreaded because those of you who work with languages like Korean, Japanese, and others where you have masses of politeness markers and particles all over the place, and it's just a nightmare, uh, one of the things that makes it a Category 4 language, uh, are particularly important when you're doing these ceremonial duties. And a lot of American embassy people in Japan, and this is true in other countries, some other countries too, are constantly having to go to events where, for example, there's a friendship treaty or uh, some kind of cooperation agreement. And it's all very ritualized. And in Japanese, the language used is is more important in a way than what you're saying. You're not really expected to say much. I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but a lot of it is uh, people say there's no content to it. I mean, Japanese people say this about, they look at some of the speeches that we got. They look at it and they say, well, they're not actually saying anything. It's all the ritual, ritual greetings and, you know, we're so delighted to be here and we thank the organization and we thank the people and, and so on and so forth. Well, what she did was she got, this is Kyoko, she got real examples of these things by native speakers of Japanese. And then she, and I, can't, I haven't got time to go through all of this, but in the rectangular boxes, she got the things which are obligatory moves in the celebration speech. In the par parallelograms, the four in the middle there, she got things which occur, but sometimes the order changes. And on the right, in the uh, ovals, uh, she has variants of those in the parallelograms that can be used. So, for example, some people will thank the organization, you know, the American Navy or the Japanese Navy or whatever it is, Sometimes they will thank the people rather than the organization. So there's these kinds of variants, and they have to stand up and give this speech. And again, it's important that they don't offend anybody. So the language used has to be just right. And there are, and so what Kyoko did when having worked out what the moves were, we then, as we, we like to do, we, we do indirect reliability on this, so we get another Japanese, in fact two in this case, who independently code the speeches to make sure that we're not making up the data. In other words, this was Kyoko's analysis, but then we see if other Japanese native speakers can replicate her analysis by being given the thing and asked to, you know, to, to, to analyze it. And uh, the 
inter-array reliability was 0.8 something and, and a perfect one for another speech that they did. They did two each. Now, in the, I didn't include this because it's all in Japanese, but in the original article, you can see that what she then did was the data mining. She went back to the dialogues, uh, the speeches, they're monologues, not dialogues. She went back to the monologues and took out all this particular language that you must use, all the specialized politeness formulae, the collocations and so forth, so that for each of those moves, that she has tables where they're linked to the language that's required. And of course, to teach this is a whole other thing which I'm not going into today because it wouldn't be relevant to most of you anyway, and there's not time. So the needs analysis has two parts. Identify the target task. Secondly, get samples of target discourse and then data mine. Just pull out all the stuff you can from it. Next stage is to design the task syllabus. And there are, these are the basic stages. We've already talked about the needs analysis at the top. That gives us the target tasks. We then classify the target tasks into target task types. Now, this may not be necessary at FSI were you ever to do this here, because I think that there is time, given the amount of hours that you have with the learners, there is time to do all the target tasks that we think diplomats use. There may be some we've missed, but we think there's time. The reason in most TBLT situations you can't do that is because very often there are more target tasks than you have time for in a semester or a six-week course or whatever it is. Here I think that would not be a problem, but the other reason we do it is because often you have mixed classes, not here so much. Here they're all going to be diplomats, although they may be in different what do you call it, streams, uh, but, or they're going to be security personnel, but very, com very homogeneous classes compared with the real world for language teaching, where you might get all sorts of people with all sorts of lang L1 sitting in front of you. So the other reason for TBLT to classify target tasks into target task types is to move up a level to a more abstract level where you can group together sets of target tasks that share certain things, not time to go through all this today, and then the idea is that you're more likely to appeal to more people in the class at any one time than if you just started peeling off individual target tasks, which might be perfect for these people, but not relevant at all for these people over here. That's why we do it. So one is to save time, the idea being that if, say, there are five target tasks in one target task type, we don't have time to teach all five, so we could say teach two, and then test later to see if the, what they learn for those two generalizes to the other three members of the category. So it's time saving and it's the heterogeneity of student classes that are the problems there. Here I don't think you'd need to do that. We then derive pedagogic tasks. This is, the, this is materials. This is what people actually work on in the classroom. The teacher and the students work on this stuff together either online or, or in face-to-face -face, whatever it is. And we sequence the target tasks, the, excuse me, sequence the pedagogic tasks according to increasing task complexity. And here we hit upon the first area where still we're having problems. T TBLT is not a done deal. It's, not a, it's certainly not a panacea. It doesn't solve all our problems. Uh, it solves a lot of problems, but not, not this one is still somewhat up in the air. The, the, the empirical findings have been somewhat mixed on this. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but just to give you an example, way back when I was working in Hawaii, University of Hawaii, we did a, a needs analysis of flight attendants, airline flight attendants. Some American companies at the time were employing native speakers of other languages because they thought that if you had, say, 300 passengers on a 747, wouldn't it be good if, and, and most of them didn't speak English, wouldn't it be good if at least one of the flight attendants spoke that language? Uh, something that many other companies have been doing for a long time. Now most American companies do it, but they didn't then. And so one of the things they had to do was to teach English to enough English for the flight attendants who are coming from some of these other countries. And what we did, first of all, we found, I think it was 104, from memory, 104 target tasks for airline flight attendants. And I've just used some of the easiest examples here just to make the point about how, to, how they move from the target task to the syllabus. So some of the target tasks were they serve breakfast, serve lunch, serve dinner, drinks and snacks. And so at the target task type level, we can say they serve food and beverages, right? And the idea will be that if we can teach them successfully to do two of those target tasks, they should be able to do the others. Okay. The next one was check life vests, seat belts, oxygen cylinders, etc. Check safety equipment. Check overhead bins, luggage stored under seats, passengers in assigned seats, etc. Prepare for takeoff. Get the idea? So we classic, we're moving up a level of generalization, out of a level of abstraction. Uh, and 
The next thing is, how do we sequence the pedagogic tasks, the materials that will actually be done in the classroom to do those target tasks? And the basic, the, if you only take one thing away, it's to simplify the task, not the language. Because remember, in commercial grammar-based or any kind of linguistically-based materials, what they do all the time is manipulate the language, not what people are doing. Uh, whereas the focus in TBLT, again, is on the tasks, not on the language per se. The language comes en passant, while they're doing the pedagogic tasks. So we simplify the tasks, that's how we sequence. We build schema if necessary. Again, here, for most of your students, they will have the schema because they may have done three years in Moscow and now they're going to Baghdad or wherever it is, but they know how to do the job already. But in many cases, learners are pre-experienced. They have no clue. They know, I need to know enough English to be a airline flight attendant or something, or, but, but they're pre-training, pre-experience. They know what they want to do, but they really don't know what the tasks are that they need to be able to do to do that occupation, say. Input-based before production-based PTs, pedagogic tasks. Do parts before whole, we break them down. This is how we simplify the tasks. We use foreigner talk adjustments, we build in redundancy. This is how we keep in the complex language while making, the the, 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 making it comprehensible without denuding it of the things they need to learn. We build in redundancy, we elaborate the input, we use a slower pace, we use intentional pausing before and after key information bearing items, we use repetition and many other things initially. But after the learners begin to improve in proficiency, we gradually remove the crutches, we gradually take away those aids until eventually they can do the full target task without those sorts of help. Now I'm going to skip this just because of time. Uh, there's been a lot of research on, on this area, suffice to say. There's been statistical meta-analyses now of, of the studies of this, this sort of thing. And the findings are mixed. There's not a clear, uh, a clear outcome, not clear enough. And in TBLT, uh, it can be criticized in many ways, but not, not for lack of empirical evidence. I mean, there's more research behind TBLT and a lot more research on TBLT than every other language teaching approach together, 10 times more. Uh, and one of the reasons is that because it appeals to SLA research, SLA research has got involved with this right at the beginning. And as you may know, there's a biannual conference every two years. There's an international conference on TBLT. In fact, two of the French uh, teachers here attended the one in Leuven about three or four years ago, presenting a paper of what's been going on in French here. Um, and if you go to those conferences, and I go to most of them, you find almost as many SLA people doing hardcore SLA studies on TBLT as you do if you go to SLURF, which traditionally has been the major second language acquisition conference in this country. Uh, so you have a lot of empirical research here, uh, and we, that's one of the things we try to do, which is to be accountable to empirical findings, not somebody like me sitting in an armchair and say, do this, don't do that. That's sort of seat of your pants, armchair pontification. We try to do it with a scientific basis. Uh, there's also a logistical problem. We can often get native speaker judges, uh, applied linguists, for example, to give the to give the correct answer when we show them a series of pedagogic tasks. We, we mix them up, uh, there's different ways of doing this, we mix up and say, can you tell us, rank these from the simplest to the most complex? And they give us the answer like that, total agreement. It's obvious to them what it is. We then run those tasks with non-native speakers in the laboratory and we don't always get the same result. Uh, why could this be? Well, here's, uh, it may be that very often the learners don't notice the added complexity that we deliberately build in. Why are we doing that? Well, we're building in more complex tasks because the idea is that language is, their language development is pushed along as they gradually have to do more and more complex versions of the uh, uh, working towards the target tasks. Uh, so this is important. Um, the other thing is that sometimes it's not just that they, they don't recognize it, which is just accidental, but sometimes they recognize it, but they avoid it. They find they can do the task without dealing with all the added complexity that we've laboriously built in, which is defeating the object of the exercise because it means that their language is not being stretched. Uh, and here's an example. Ji Yong Lee was a PhD student. She graduated last year, and she, her article on this is in the Journal called Applied Linguistics. Here's three tasks to use. She, she had three tasks in this. This wasn't her dissertation. This was a, one of her empirical qualifying papers. She had three tasks, three different versions of each. The simplest one, the middle one, and the most complex one. And this one, it was about describing a traffic accident. You witnessed a traffic accident. I'm going to show you the three clips 
And I'm going to ask you afterwards in what way you think the, the different clips are more complex than another. So this was the first one. Oh, oh! now how do I do this when I don't have the arrows? <laughs> one? Uh, how do I do this, though? I need somebody who knows how to do a computer can find the, uh, the, the arrow which starts it off. I don't have a mouse. I don't have a, do I have a keyboard even? Oh, do you, the keyboard's under the, so I need to get, hit that. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Notice the guy didn't stop, by the way. <laughs> it, just, it just went on. Okay, so that's the first one. Now, here's the second one. On YouTube, you can find masses of stuff you can use for language teaching, as I expect you've realized. And here's the third one. This is probably taken in Minnesota somewhere. Now, where's the arrow again? Uh, there. Minnesota in deep winter. So you have an icy hillside. It gets worse. This guy was taking his life into his own hands. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. Now, of those three, which was the most complex and which is the least and on what criteria were you making the judgment? How many cars are there? How many cars? So the number of items or the number of elements? Yeah. And so which was the simplest, do you think? One, two or three? <laughs> one because it had one vehicle, right? Yeah. What about the other two? Yeah, that's what we thought and, and native speaker judges gave it in that order, you know, that the second one was an accident involving two vehicles uh, and so on, and the last one had you know, five or six involved and so forth. So that was the order we expected. But look at the results. I mean, she, she looked at all sorts of linguistic outcome measures, but here's a, here's a syntactic one. So one of her things was subordinate clauses per AS unit. Think of it as an utterance. It's not quite the same, but similar. And the first one, the mean was 0.92 subordinate clauses per AS unit. The number two, it did indeed increase. You know, they, they had to use more complex language to explain the second accident. But look what happened with the third one. Uh, they, they, what did they do? Did they just not notice these other cars coming down the hill? Or they just said, oh, to hell with this, you know, this is getting too, too complicated. And they just forgot it. And in fact, what they did was what I just said. They didn't say to hell with it, but they did actually just ignore a lot of what happened in the number three. And this is one of the problems. In other words, we can come up with pretty ideas about how to increase complexity, but if it's not going to actually work in the classroom, it's, we've got to find other ways of doing it. So what we've, and several studies, by the way, have, got that, have found that problem. So what we've then moved on to, this is here at Maryland, people doing this stuff, is we've moved on to saying how can we prevent that? How can we constrain it so that they can't do that, that they have to deal with the complexity? And we've had two ideas, and neither of these ideas are perfect either, but then we've only just started working with them, so we may be able to get it to work eventually. The first one is task closure. You have open and closed tasks. The second one is feedback loops. How am I doing for time? I've got to try and get through a lot more stuff. To close a task, it means that there's either only one correct answer, or one of a finite, small finite number. And importantly, the students doing the task must be told that, because if they don't realize that there's only one correct answer, they'll just start you know, saying anything they want again. So we give them some kind of 
closed tasks, the idea being that if it's closed, if they can't just ignore stuff, they will have to use more precise language, they'll have to deal with complexity and therefore linguistic complexity in order to do the task. Whereas the open tasks, where for example they ask their opinions about things or they can do anything they want with something, will be much easier for them to avoid complexity. Um, and we have tested this with geometric figures tasks, all sorts of very simple things. Here's another example where we've looked at open and closed tasks. This is a seating arrangement tasks. In the simplest version there are six seats and there are no constraints. People are just told you've got six people coming for dinner, you can seat them any way you like, uh, how would you like to do it? Uh, now we can add complexity, it says on the right at the bottom. We have versions of this with four people, six people, eight people, with no constraints, like the one you're seeing on the screen, with one, two, or three constraints. I'm just gonna skip ahead. Here's the most complex version where you have, actually not the most complex, there's still only six people, we've got one with eight people. Six people but three constraints. Look at the three rules in the middle. No two men or two women can sit next to one another. Left, political left-wingers can be seated next to one another or next to political centrists but not next to right-wingers. Right-wingers can sit next to one another or to centrists but not to left-wingers. You could do this with uh, Real Madrid and Barca supporters, you could, you could put in any, any Qual any issues you like. With the Real Madrid one, you'd have to have a separate room for them, though. Um, <laughs> people must be able to speak at least one of the languages of the people on each side of them. And then they're given these characters, little character cards, where they're very, you know, stereotyped. This is just to show you the kind of materials it is. You can actually, of course, change this drastically to make it a a suitable intellectually and culturally for diplomats. Um, but sometimes they do have to work out which diplomats are supposed not to encounter each other at a cocktail party because they're at war and that kind of thing. Uh, John is an American, is a businessman, he's very conservative, he speaks English and German. Golf, vintage cars are his hobbies. Pierre is French, a physician, left wing, French, and he speaks French and Spanish, walking, and so on. And the idea is that there is, an, it, there is actually, um, I, I designed these things, there is only one seating arrangement that works if you if you fulfill the constraints, right? Now, the problem is still that although we know it works in theory, it's still possible for people just to ignore some of the constraints and say, well, we're going to set these two people next to each other, even though not, they don't speak a common language, right? In other words, again, they can just choose to ignore, you know, some of the constraints. So what could we do about it? Another example, we've had, another idea we've had is what we call feedback loops. We want to give... <coughs> excuse me, we want to give instantaneous feedback and if you're technologically gifted like some of our students but not like myself, you can actually design these on a computer so that the program will refuse to let somebody continue until they get this step right. I don't know how to do that but some of the students do. And so uh, here's a simple case with uh, following street directions. Again, because of time, I'm gonna just flip through it. You can have a map like this, which has no, you know, you're just told you're starting here, you've got to get to such and such a place, no constraints about how you get there, any way will do. Here's one where now, although it's difficult perhaps to read it, uh, there are various obstructions in some of the streets, and here's a, the most complex versions where there's fires going on, there are roadworks, there are traffic accidents, there's all sorts of reasons, so it's very, very difficult, only one way through, and the idea is that as soon as they say something like, well, you go up Red Street and take the second on the right, if they say that, then the computer is going to stop them and stop and say, you can't do that. Or, theoretically, the teacher could do it. But then that's difficult because you're dealing with, say, four or five students simultaneously. Um, we're working on that. It's not all tasks crash and burn. I'm giving you what sometimes happens, though. And I, I do believe that it's crucial in TBRT that we are very transparent when we don't have solutions to something. Because one of my criticisms of traditional language teaching has always been that it is just made up. People have no evidence for grammatical syllabuses or, or synthetic syllabuses. We need to do better ourselves. Um, so, materials consist of pedagogic tasks, sequence according to complexity, task complexity, not linguistic complexity, but notice I'm being very open that we're not 100% able to guarantee that we can do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Samples of the L2 accompanying the pedagogic tasks are elaborated, not similar. Now, this is important, so I'm going to show you an example. Supposing, um, well, the street directions task, I'm going to skip that because that's just, again, showing how we do a simple task and gradually build it up. What I want to show you is about the input because people ask, well, how are you going to teach the grammar? Where are they going to learn the stuff and so forth? 
Let's imagine, this is a tiny text just to illustrate in a talk like this. In the book that I did, I've got much longer texts and articles about it and so forth. There's an article, in fact, coming out in language teaching later this year with a whole article about this stuff. Now, in genuine input, this is where native speakers did something for other native speakers. You might get a short text like this. This is somebody who saw the accident, says, the witness just caught a glimpse of the driver as he fled the scene, so she could only provide the police with a rough description. Okay, now you've got in there, if you're a native speaker of English, as many of you are, uh, you've got some things in there which are very idiomatic, uh, but they're the things that people actually say, to catch a glimpse of somebody, uh, to flee the scene, a rough description, and so forth. Now, in a typical commercially written textbook for ESL, English as a Second Language, you'd get something like this. A woman was the only person who saw the accident. So we've lost the word witness. She saw the driver, not glimpsed, for only a moment. The driver didn't stop. He immediately drove away fast. He fled the scene as now being reduced to he drove away fast. Not quite the same thing. The woman could only tell the police a little about him. So a rough description has been sacrificed because they say, well, a rough, they don't know what rough description is. How are they going to learn it then? So what we then do is we, we eschew simplified input and we go to elaborated, or as you'll see in a moment, modified elaborated input. Elaborated input, we keep all the hard stuff. We make it comprehensible using various devices. By the way, they're the same kind of devices that parents use with young children, except the examples are more complex, or that adults do in foreigner talk. When native speakers talk to non-natives with low proficiency, this is the kind of stuff they do. We know this because a lot of us did lots of studies of foreigner talk in the 70s and 80s. The only person who saw the accident the only witness, you see the repetition, the appositional phrases. This, of course, is redundant for another, non -native, for another native speaker interlocutor, but not for our learners. The only person who saw the accident, the only witness, was a woman. She only caught a glimpse of the driver, just saw him for a moment, because he fled the scene, driving away fast without stopping. So she could only provide the police with a rough description of him, not an accurate one. Do you see the kind of things we're doing? I mean, this is just three, set, three lines. There are lots of other ways of making stuff more comprehensible, and I'm not guaranteeing that a non-native speaker could read that and understand everything straight away, but you're halfway there. We have studies to show this. We have big studies with hundreds of subjects doing reading and hundreds of subjects doing listening and showing that if they get the, the elaborated version, their level of comprehension, as tested by all sorts of t different kinds of comprehension questions afterwards, is statistically non-significantly different from the people who get the simplified version. Even though the simplified version has got rid of all the hard vocabulary and so forth, got rid of the, the complex syntax, still they barely do better than the people with elaborated stuff. And uh, we now go one step more we use modified elaborated, so we take the elaborated passage and we cut it up because one of the problems with the elaborated passage is that the sentences become very long. They become even more complex by any traditional uh, complexity measure like Thorndike Lords, that kind of thing, even more complex than the native speaker version. So we don't want that. Uh, we cut the sentences up so we keep, we keep all the same stuff, but we just divide the sentences. So now we're back to shorter sentences. The number of S nodes per sentence is now less than uh, the uh, native speaker or the elaborated. It's the same as the simplified. And that is the ideal. We do not, of course, have to go through these four stages when we're writing materials. We just write straight away in the, elaborated, the modified elaborated. We just go straight to, the, to what we want. I'm just showing you how we get there and the difference between the, 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 the four different types. So. Um, in TBLT, the input that we give them is elab modified elaborated, so it's actually quite complex. They're going to be exposed to the things that they have to learn. And remember, if you're doing language and tasks for a specialized domain, such as diplomacy, such as embassy security, it is going to be specialized. It's no good pretending otherwise. It's no good saying, well, we're not going to touch the, the specific stuff, the specialized stuff. That's exactly what we have to do. And it's not just for diplomats, it's for any area. If you're dealing with dermatologists, you've got to deal with dermatology. It's no good talking to them about walks in the park, you know, cardboard characters in textbooks who have nothing to do with dermatology, and so on. Um, methodology and pedagogy, I can do this very quickly because I want to leave 30 minutes for questions, uh, comments, or throwing things. Uh, methodology and pedagogy, we have 10 methodological principles. Now, there are 10 at the moment, it's a round number, but it's an accident that there are 10. 
Uh, these can change over time. Uh, if, if research results come in which put some into question, then we go back to the drawing board and we modify things. But right now, there are these 10, which are, have show, been reproduced in all sorts of papers and articles, not just by me. Uh, use task, not text, as the unit of analysis. Promote learning by doing. Elaborate input. Provide rich input. Notice that in traditional language teaching, although I skipped all this at the beginning, the typical input from the teacher in the textbook is what we call impoverished input. It's just the same few lexical items illustrating sentence patterns, and they go again and again. And again, there's lots of empirical studies of classroom language use doing the different kinds of uh, teaching. We want rich input, lots of it, and we want to indu encourage inductive chunk learning. So for collocations, if those of you know anything about child language, I mean, the, the little children make very few errors with collocations because they're learning them as chunks. Um, adults, on the other hand, have huge problems with things like phrasal verbs. You know, am I going to put on the light, put off the light, switch on, switch off, switch out, switch into, and so on and so forth. They are, in many cases, trying to put together a verb and a preposition, or in collocations, why do they, if you say the government announced war on such and such a country, a native speaker will say, what, announced war? You don't announce war, you declare war. You know, they declared war on such and such. There are all these collocations which native speakers know, they're not aware of them until you point it out to them, but they know right away what is native speaker English, in this case, or whatever languages you teach, and what is not. Now, those collocations are exactly what advanced learning is mostly about. Now, you guys are teaching people up to level 3.3, three, I think, in, in the dipl diplomat side of things anyway. That's advanced. Um, and most people who are at 2 and above already know the grammar. Now, yes, they still make an occasional mistake on a very low frequency, rare rule. So in, in English, you can get people 2.2 two who are saying things like, Rarely he had seen such a terrible accident. Whereas, of course, we all know that it should be rarely had he seen, right? Uh, rarely had he seen. So after you get these, this negative polarity stuff, if you front an, one of these kind of adverbs, you're supposed to invert. It's a hangover from some old German rule, I think. You get that kind of thing still at that level. But basic syntax is down. Basic morphology is down. Yes, there'll be some still tricky things with, say, Japanese particles or Korean particles, something like that, but not much. What they don't know at advanced levels is their vocabulary is always much smaller than they would like it to be, and much smaller than native speakers, and their knowledge of collocations is often pretty bad still. So a lot of advanced learning is precisely needs to focus on lexis and collocations and specialized lexis and collocations, by which we mean the kind of things, a pity, for those of you who have the, have the, trans, the uh, handout, if you look, not now, but if you look later, if you're interested, at the police traffic stop, and that's a simple example, even in the policeman, when he, gives, when he speaks to the driver and says, I'm just giving you a warning, there are two or three collocations in there that you'd never find in a regular textbook. And if you go to more complex tasks, you'll find lots of examples of things which are cut out of commercial materials. Um, focus on form, in other words, we're responding to grammatical problems, we elaborate on things that students say and write, we feed in stuff, and the advantage of that is if they say something in class and they make an error in it, and that's the moment you <coughs> teach something, you feed in the correct answer, either explicitly, you know, with traditional error correction of some kind, error correction, because it often it doesn't correct at all, but we think it does, or implicitly with corrective recast, which is the way lots of the research is supporting, not perfect, but supporting, uh, without changing the focus onto forms, but continuing the focus on communication. Whichever way we do it, um, we are doing something where the speaker, who, the learner, who's just made the error, already knows what he or she was trying to say, so when we give the correct version right back, hopefully in a communicative mode still, talking upon... So it, I'll just make up an example of... You're, t you're teaching somebody about when Napoleon invaded Russia, and, it's a, it, and it, we imagine it's being done in English. Uh, and so the, the, the people have read a story or whatever it is, they've seen a video or a film, and the teacher asks the students, why did, uh, when, did, uh, when did Napoleon invade Russia? And the student says, uh, Napoleon invade in whatever date it was. And then 
the teacher might say, uh, that's right, he invaded in whatever it was, and is now providing the, the missing ud, right, the invaded. Of course, he could do, he could resort to more explicit stuff. A thousand volts under the fingernails, slapping of the face, <laughs> don't ever make that mistake again, I, I will never, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's, there's, You can have different degrees of explicitness and implicitness, but uh, fortunately, the research increasingly shows that adults can and do learn a lot from implicit negative feedback. It is not always necessary, in fact, it's often unnecessary to resort to electric shock treatment. You know, you can get away with recasts. So why not do it? Because, all joking aside, if you can do it that way, it means you can maintain focus on the tasks. You don't have to switch and sort of develop linguistic schizophrenia in the classroom. So sometimes you're asking us to do the task, next minute you're giving us a grammar lesson, right? Because remember, if they just tried to say something, they already know what it was they were trying to say. They can hold in short-term memory long enough to compare their output with your immediate input. And it's called cognitive comparison in the L1 literature, they can notice the difference much of the time. Doesn't mean to say they will now get it right every time, but they're on the way. And by the way, if you give them the electric shock treatment, doesn't mean to say they're going to get it right you know, immediately either. Uh, the general research on explicit versus implicit instruction or feedback shows that although explicit stuff gets an immediate bump in performance on an immediate post-test, that improvement often deteriorate, dissipates, it just declines over time. So if there's a delayed post-test in these studies, the implicit treatment on the other hand, whether it's implicit instruction or implicit feedback, not only doesn't decline, it actually improves over time. And the current explanation, and I admit there's some speculation involved in this, is that with implicit instruction or implicit feedback, there's greater depth of processing. And therefore, it's like the learner has digested the stuff at a more serious or deeper level. And therefore, that's why it's like these sleep studies, you know, when babies learn something and then they go to sleep, they're better at it the next day. Or when students are cramming for an exam, they do the same thing. They wake up the next morning and they, learn, they know more, more thing better. The idea is that that's why the implicit stuff tends to be more durable. And again, there are statistical, two statistical meta-analyses of this. Uh, Gu and Mackey, 2007. Uh, Xiaofeng Li, 2010 in language learning, for those of you who read the journals, showing this durability, greater durability of imp what is learned implicitly over explicitly. Now that doesn't mean to say, and there's other things there, provide negative feedback, of course, respect learners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, which I don't have time for, but again, in, in various places, there's extensive reviews of the literature to support these things. Now, Pedagogic procedures, unlike methodological principles, are not supposed to be universal. This is where the teacher comes in and makes the decisions because only you know, your students, that particular moment in the class, do you need to use more explicit feedback for a particular linguistic target or for a particular learner, depending if you've got high, low aptitude learners, if it's a salient, perceptually salient or non-salient linguistic target and so forth. And you know that, nobody else knows that. You have to adjust. I think teaching in task-based language teaching is more demanding of the teacher than teaching in a traditional thing where you're just going through the exercises one after another. I think it's more, you have to be more on your feet, so, or even if you're sitting down, you have to be more ready to, you know, d not to improvise, but to recognize in a way you're doing instant diagnosis of the problems very often. And most of you are experienced teachers. I, I know that from knowing something about how it's FSI stuff. You're not teaching the language for the first time. You, you get a very good sense of where the problems are, what they're likely to get wrong, and so forth. You can often be right ready with the thing. The difference is that you didn't walk in that morning and write up a, an example of a, of a Korean particle on the blackboard and say, this is used and then give them a grammatical explanation and then start drilling it. That's not what happened because there's no reason to believe that the students in the class are ready for it anyway on that particular day just because it's the next thing in a textbook. No, you're responding to their attempt to say something when they're missing that obligatory particle, if indeed it is obligatory. Uh, so the PPs, the pedagogic procedures, are very much the teacher's responsibility to choose. And there's a huge range of things. So just to give um, an example, if you had, say, one of the methodological principles is provide negative feedback, which is supported by research in general psychology, research in language acquisition, research in education, 
if you were going to do this, we've already said you could go from the implicit end of the spectrum, recast, clarification request, and on, to the explicit, where you give grammatical rules of thumb, prompts, elicits, etc. And I would suggest there's no clear evidence for this, but there are three studies in the literature which suggest that the more salient, more perceptually salient, or if you like, noticeable the problem, the more you can rely on implicit negative feedback. But the less perceptually salient something is, the more you're probably going to have to move along the spectrum and use more explicit things. So for example, again, I'm using English examples. If you have something like adverb placement, he liked very much Barcelona, then that's something that you should be able to get away with either with implicit negative feedback because it's so salient, it's a free morpheme, it bears meaning, etc., etc. It's got all the good features, or even with uh, indirect negative feedback, you just, you know, they never hear support for this, you don't even have to intervene at all, they just will drop that idea. Because I mean, of course languages like French, Spanish, Japanese and so on, you can do that, you've got free word order. You can put the adverbs in any way you like, basically. Uh, but in English you can only say um, he likes Barcelona very much or he very much likes, but you can't do he likes very much, that's ungrammatical. So if they are a speaker of a language that allows that, and they're now moving to a language which doesn't, this comes from an argument by Lydia White, by the way, uh, then you're going to get an error. And the question is, how do you intervene, or do you even have to intervene, given what kind of error it is? Whereas, look across the other side, he liked very much Barcelona. You've got a different error in there as well. He likes, and the S is missing. Now, that's got all the hallmarks of a problem, problematic, non-salient linguistic target. It doesn't carry meaning, it's totally redundant, many languages don't even mark that kind of uh, thing. It has no value really. Um, English is a weird language, I mean we know that by now. And so there, if, if it's important, you're probably going to have to intervene with something being a bit more he heavy-handed. You know, you're going to have to be more explicit. So, but that's the kind of decision which the teacher has to decide on. So to summarize, grammar-based or task-based language teaching in um, grammar-based language teaching and what's called PPP, present, practice, produce, uh, sort of the drill kind, audio-lingual kind of stuff, the L2 is the object of instruction. It's what the, the class is about the language. And learning is intentional. The people are sitting there trying to learn particular bits of the language, and the aim and the product is explicit knowledge. They know the rule, or they know at least the rule-like statistical pattern. TBLT is the opposite. Language is the medium of instruction, just as it is in immersion education, for example, study abroad programs, ideally. Enhanced incidental learning and implicit knowledge. Again, I wish I had more time to talk about, say, enhanced incidental learning. I don't today. To summarize, if you compare them, grammar-based down the left, TBLT down the right. Language is object, communication. Structure is the unit of analysis, pedagogic task. I'll let you read those yourself. No needs analysis, notice for grammar-based language teaching. I mean, they just, everybody gets the same, the same program, the same course. Doesn't matter why they're learning, they all get the same book. It's chosen before you even meet the students. Uh, makes no sense. Um, so I've got language for nebulous purposes, as opposed to language for specific purposes, and so forth. Explicit knowledge is the typical product versus implicit, more differences. Grammar-based uses generic materials. Publishers love it because they can sell more books if they're good for everybody. And so they have the same textbook which they use on their international lists all over the world, regardless of what, why people are learning. Whereas with TBLT, the materials are usually written for a particular program. And if you have something like FSI, where you have stable throughput, in other words, you know that not only have you got these guys or gals who are learning such and such a language for 24 weeks, 64 weeks, whatever it is, you're going to have more of them next year, more of them the year after, and so forth. So if you put in the heavy lifting at the beginning to do the needs analysis, which I think has already been done, in fact, here, and then to produce the materials and so forth, you're not, you're not just producing it for the first generation of people doing that language, but for many generations to come. Especially when you have a population like you have here, this is, I think, a natural, because it's, it's, it's making the, the programs obviously relevant and specific to your kinds of learners, and once you've got them, you can revise them, of course, and improve them, but you can use them again and again. It's not like, say, ESL in this country, where the people who sit in front of you from one semester to the next are from different countries, from different, I mean, different occupations, they're all doing it for different reasons. It's much, more hard, it's much harder to teach. 
Uh, the textbook is in control in grammar-based, the teacher is in control in task-based, and the teacher and the materials writer. By the way, it's not the, I should stress this, it's not the job of the classroom teacher to do the needs analysis or to write the materials or write the tests. That's the job of your curriculum units, your testing units, the institution, which you have here. Unlike many language programs, you have a huge infrastructure here. You've also got incredible facilities. Uh, I can't believe the facilities. It's like going into a very, very posh Waikiki hotel when you walk up <laughs> in, in, in Building F. Um, and finally, I'd say there's vanishingly little research, which means no research, in support of most grammar-based approaches. There's a lot of research support for most aspects, not all of TBLT. There are still a couple of problematic areas. And I can pretty much wind up here because student assessment, I think John Norris is coming to do that. And if he is, you can't get anybody better anyway. He's superb at this stuff, knows TBLT back to front, and is very, very good at testing. He works at ETS now. Um, and the, the, this is one of the hardest things for traditionally trained teachers to get their heads around because the, aunt, the idea with task-based testing is can they do the task? Can you pass the driver's test or can't you? And if they can pass it, it doesn't matter if they're making grammatical errors. Now, somebody asked me this morning, supposing people have got to learn 12 cases in Estonian or whatever it is, case endings, how can you deal with that? Well, in fact, you can deal with it in TBLT. The difference is that you don't walk in, put the 12 cases up on the board, and bore them to sleep talking about case endings in Estonian. Rather, as the opportunity arises, you feed, you draw their attention to these things in the input as they come up in communicative situations. We teach the grammar, but we just do it very differently. Uh, the question, though, with the end is, can they do the visa interview? Can they do the target tasks that they have to do? Can they order a taxi in the street if the embassy car failed to show up or if there's an emergency and so forth? Can they do it to criterion? And there are lots of examples of this, of lectures for academic purpose students, because I'm trying to make it relevant to today to FSI people, but of course TBLT is already being used in many other situations, so nothing to do with diplomats. Uh, international students at universities in the US, for example. Uh, there's a big question, which I'll leave it to John or whoever does that talk to discuss, which is, is a linguistic caboose ever needed? In other words, are there any circumstances, and some diplomatic things might be one of them, where you also actually do want independently to evaluate particular uses of the language? And that example I gave of the Japanese celebration speech is one such. But it's a very controversial issue in TBLT, because once you start adding in a linguistic caboose, you risk wash back such that people start teaching particular linguistic forms rather than to do the task. And then finally, program evaluation. There are two, there's a recently a statistical meta-analysis. The two general findings are these. In lab studies, TBLT gets the same performance on post-tests whether if they're forms focused. In other words, if they're discrete point grammar tests, no difference. But if there are communicative outcome me measures, the TBLT people outperform the traditional language taught people statistically significantly. That's typical in lab studies, controlled cause and effect studies. Recently, 2017, Rifonsky and Mackay published an article, a statistical meta-analysis in language teaching research, where they looked at 50 some uh, examples where TBLT programs have been implemented on a longitudinal basis in many countries around the world. And they got an effect size of 0.93, which, if you don't know, is pretty high. Uh, a strong, you know, a much better result for TBLT performance than for traditional language teaching, grammar-based stuff. And the other thing, which is also, I don't know any study that has not found this, teacher and student response is always more positive than for traditional programs. And of course it would be, because they can recognize when it's done for them and not for somebody else. So with that, I'll stop, and there's still about 15 minutes for questions, right, uh, Jim? Yeah, okay. So if anybody wants to have a go at this or ask questions, now is the time. 15 minutes, we can get in a lot in 15 minutes. I don't know your name, so I'm just going to have to point, the lady there. <laughs> Yeah. 
This is a very good question. It comes up every time I was saying to somebody this morning, every time I give a talk on this, this is always one of the questions, and for obvious reasons. Uh, so here, for example, your people have to pass the FSI test, and it's then translated into ILR levels of 3.3 or whatever it is that they have to do. Uh, and there are much worse examples than that. I mean, there are countries like Japan, Korea, China, and so forth, where the English test at the end of high school, which is more like an IQ test than an English test, is crucial for deciding which university they can get into and so forth. And those tests are very, very much forms focused. So my answer is that TBLT itself cannot solve this problem. Uh, the problem lies in, well, not, let's don't even call it an emotive word like problem. Let's just say that the decision is made by the institution, in this case the United States government, or at least the Foreign Service Institute, to continue to use a particular test, which may be very interesting to people, uh, but in fact does not tell you at all whether people can do a job or not. Uh, nobody has ever said, well, can people, can people... Uh, can people, and this is not unique to FSI, this is true of DLI and other places I've you know, been to and so on, uh, other agencies around this area, uh, they all have the same problem. And that is that even if somebody gets to say two plus on a particular test, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will be able to go to Beijing or wherever it is and read technical reports on say automobile production in, Shang in Shanghai and write the gist in English. It, it, it obviously, somebody who's two plus is probably going to be better at it than somebody who's two or one plus, but no guarantee. If you do as I do, you work in universities most of your career, you are used to having international students coming in, lots of them over time, and some of the ones who know more grammar than you do can't understand, they couldn't follow today's talk, for example. They just don't have any implicit knowledge at all. They just can't handle the speed of delivery and so forth. And then you get other people in the class whose scores on the TOEFL or IELTS or whatever it is were terrible, but they have no problem at all with this. In other words, what I'm saying is there's often a big mismatch between knowledge about, in this case English or whatever it is, and ability to use English, right, for all sorts of things. So the problem I have with all those kinds of institutionalized tests, and it's not just government stuff, it's in, you know, all the uh, universities use TOEFL, IELTS, and so on and so forth, uh, same problem. Knowing that somebody has such and such a score on one of these exams is not at all a guarantee that they will or will not be able to understand lectures in economics or whatever it is they're coming to study. Uh, and we could give lots and lots of examples of this. TBLT, of course, cannot change the fact that in this case the diplomats happen to have to, to reach such and such a level on the FSI test. Uh, what I would personally recommend, but this is, I understand these are huge logistical decisions with money implications, all sorts of implications. What I would suggest is that if they have to keep doing the regular test and get an ILR rating because salary may be tied to it and, you know, they get an increase of 600 a month, whatever it is, if they keep, get to and then maintain a particular level, okay, let them do it. But I would also suggest that a, a parallel, I mean, I may be, this may be, absolutely outrageous thing to say, um, and I'll be shot afterwards, but I would, I would say, <laughs> why, why not have a second test which actually tests people's ability to do the job that they're going to go out to do in the real world? Because, and, and I'm, I'm not, although it may sound like it, I'm not saying this for popular, to be popular or anything. I had no idea there'd be this reaction. I thought you'd all be saying, oh, we can't do that. But, but I can tell you that I happen to know some diplomats, and I have one or two students who are married to diplomats and so forth, and the general response is, and these are smart people, they can tell the difference, and often they're on second, third postings uh, now, uh, they're not juniors, they're you know, fairly high up the, the uh, food chain, and they are very explicit off the record in terms of what they wish they had been taught, not necessarily here, but in many generations of language learning, in different languages. And these are people who've reached very high levels in these languages. Some of them are unbelievably good. I mean, you must know some of them. They're unbelievably good at category four languages, and they know two of them, or three of them. And I'm not talking just about FSI, I'm talking about people at some of the intelligence agencies and so on. Unbelievably good. And yet, they recognize very often that what they know is not actually what they need to know to do their jobs. Now, many of them are so smart that they can do it anyway. You know, they find other ways around it. But they often come up with things like, why don't you teach us, you know, the things we actually are going to need to do in, in the field, especially first-time 
postings, you know, people who are suddenly faced with what the real job consists of. Now, I, d I do not have a solution for that, but I would say that the, the literature on experimental work, you know, including classroom studies, where people have evaluated university courses for a semester or a year, taught with some kind of completely communicative, for example, the natural <coughs> approach, Krashen and Terrell. There's a big study in modern language journal, I think, going back about 15, 20 years, where I think six classes of Spanish were taught using natural approach, six classes were taught using, I'm a book, you're a book, yesterday was a book, today is a book, you know, and so on. And the students who got the natural approach, which I do not support, by the way, this is like turn on the tap, retire to a safe distance. You give them lots of comprehensible input and then rely on the students to induce the grammar. So I don't believe in that. I don't think that's efficient. I don't believe the literature supports that that's a, at all the best way of doing it. But those people outperform the people who got the traditional language course. I know I can do better with enhanced incidental learning. You need to speed things up. People can't just sit there and learn this stuff over a long time. You need to intervene and, and, you know, you, and draw attention to things that they're not going to notice maybe ever just from comprehensible input. And it's not my word for this. Look at the research on French immersion in Canada. Meryl Swain, people like that have shown for decades that people who just get uh, immersion, even full time from the age of say six or seven or eight or nine until they graduate at 18 from high school, they are often, st the best of them, are statistically non-significantly different in receptive skills, listening and reading, from monolingual French age peers, people from you know, deep, deep Quebec. They're very, very good, no cost to their other subjects by the way, but on productive skills, so speaking and writing, they are still making, I quote from Meryl Swain, 1991, making a wide range of basic morphosyntactic errors, unquote. In other words, they are still making errors with things that they have heard literally millions of examples of because they've had all their teaching in French for year after year after year, all their subjects, and yet they're still making mistakes because they just haven't, in many cases, even noticed the problem. You know, silent S's in their writing, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, it's well known that that kind of approach is not adequate. But notice, it's better than traditional language teaching. The experimental studies, the classroom studies support that, and the studies we have of TBLT support that. So it doesn't, doesn't answer your question, I'm afraid, uh, but, I, <laughs> but, I, but I, think, I think that to solve the problem of these big, nasty exams lurking in the long grass, uh, you have got to deal with the institution uh, or the education system. And the Japanese government, to its credit, has recognized this and they are now in the process of modifying these exams. My name is Carlos Parra from the Spanish department. Uh, you mentioned the difference between somebody learning uh, the language to be faced for the first time overseas. I wonder if you have come across any specific evidence in your in studies and research uh, of the importance of targeting the particular population, meaning that the experience that the diplomat has certainly helps in uh, learning the tasks that he already knows he will have to perform as opposed to those who are new to the job. Very good question. Yeah, I can't, I can't give you a study which has compared that population with a population that didn't have the pre-experience. But what I can tell you is that a project I consulted on about seven years ago now was for the US Border Patrol. They had read some of this stuff. And their Spanish program down in New Mexico, you know, they, they, where Roswell is where the training programs are, uh, was not doing well. It was a typical thing. It was a relexified grammatical syllabus. You know, so instead of saying, this is a bottle of water, they say, esto es una botella de agua. You know, and it, it just re relexifying in Spanish basic stuff. The agents were then getting out in the field, so they're sitting out in the desert for 12 hours at a time, dying of boredom. And occasionally they have to get into action. And then what they do is they would buddy up with a heritage language speaker of Spanish who actually spoke Spanish and could use it, and that person would handle it for both of them. They reported this. So uh, a Beltway Bandit in the DC area got a big government contract to come up with a new program that would provide these agents with functional language proficiency, and that program, that 
company contacted me and I put together a team of people to do it and they, they spent lots of money on the materials. I mean, unbelievable amount of money that the government has for doing language programs, I can't believe it. If you come from a state university, a public university, you walk around the buildings in these places and you, and you think you have chairs and, and tables, uh, never, never mind all the screens and all that kind of stuff. And this, this pro, pro, uh, project, they flew a Hollywood film team out from California to make the videos to go with the course. Give you some idea. The amount of money that was spent on it, unbelievable. The reason I tell you all this backstory is because what did work there, and this is the model they use, is that what happens with complete ab initio agents, people who've never done the job before, they go down there, they do an eight week training pro uh, course, seven different scenarios, they call them, which are like target task types in TBLT. And then the eighth week is for testing. And there's a big campus, and the testing is really task-based. It's like, say, the consular visa things you have, or the jail, all the set things that are set up in this building, or the, in the F building. They have the same thing. They drive around the, the campus, and they have a professional actors playing the parts of you know, a aliens, quote-unquote, crossing the border, of all sorts of people doing all the different things. They do bus checks of IDs on the buses, which is one of the things they have to do. They have professional actors playing the role of the entire passengers in the bus buses and so forth. So it's all, money's not a problem. Um, and what was done was that in, instead of just doing the eight-week training course, they did the eight-week training course in English and then immediately turned around and repeated it in Spanish. And I can tell you that there, there's an article in the, in the published literature written by two ex-students of mine who, who actually did a lot of the work on this, not me, uh, where they did an evaluation study, three different types of evaluation. It's in language teaching research in 2013 or 14, I forget. It's Marta Gonzalez Lloret, who I understand is coming. Excellent, superb on the technology. Um, and uh, Katie Nielsen, one of our Maryland graduates, now works for Voxy in New York. Um, and uh, they did an evaluation, they're including the, the feedback from the agents in the field who were saying, now I can actually do the job, you know, I can actually do it in Spanish. Uh, we also, we, they tested the students, the last generation of students who went through the traditional program were tested, and then the first generation of students who went through the TBLT program that was introduced were tested, and any, any comparison you look, the TBLT people did better. So, there was a case where people who'd not done, who, who had not actually done the job of being an agent, but had done the training, were able to do quite well. It seemed to work very well to do, once you actually know the job, or at least you've just recently done the training, then to do it in the other language. That seemed to be a very good model. And we were talking about this, some of us this morning, about having visited some of these things where the people who do the content-based training, I don't know what you call that now, was it con, con, con or something? Yeah, somebody would do that with, say, the visa interviews. Could they then, I ask, could they not turn around and do the same thing in Spanish, say? Uh, and I understand that there are delicate areas that you can't start making decisions. You can't train people to make decisions about substantive issues in the language program. But there are other ways, perhaps, around this. Um, I think that would be a very viable model. I can't point to a study, certainly not of diplomats, I can't point to a study where somebody has compared people who have done the training versus people who've not done the job who then both get the same program. I, I don't know of any, anything like that. There is a lot of research on TBLT, masses of studies, masses. There are 20 to 30 books on TBLT now. Every time you open a journal, any of the mainstream journals, there's usually at least one article about it, and it's from all over the world, including countries where people initially said, oh, you could never do TBLT in China. I think some more articles, well, there's a lot more Chinese, but there's more articles coming out of China about TBLT than just about any other country. They said you could never do it in Japan because people, you know, for various cultural reasons, aren't just not true. I mean, people used to say you could never do group work in Japan. What rubbish. I mean, where do people come up with this stuff from? Um, so people, you know, uh, from all those kind of countries which were... Now, there are one or two countries which I'm not going to get into where I think there could be a problem for TBLT. Let's take countries where such and such a religion is particularly implanted in the culture, quote unquote, and the education system is built on it, and where the uh, traditional teacher-student relationship and the religion thrown in is so strong that they might object to such things as student-initiated interaction in the classroom, which in TBLT you get a lot of. You know, if it's communicative, students are saying things that not necessarily are just rote repeating things that they've been told to say and so on. So I can imagine there could be one or two tricky countries 
for that. But I'm not prepared to believe that that's actually anything more than tradition. It's not a cultural thing. Cultural is just learned behavior anyway. And at some point, it wasn't learned behavior. It's not genetic. Otherwise, there wouldn't be different cultures, right? So I don't accept ever that you can't do TBT or any other kind of training, for that matter, in country X, just because country X has never done it that way before. Uh, but that doesn't answer your question. In fact, I'm, I'm good at not answering people's questions, you know. <laughs>